Hey, welcome everyone back to our second session here of our spring conference hosted by Community Price Mission, Mission Center. We're focusing on the theme of courageously choose love. This is our second session of three speakers, and we invite you to join us for a prayer for peace following the conclusion of this uh, session right at two o'clock is our plan. Our uh, next presentation is going to be by recording, and this is presented to us by Megan Hacker. Megan started with the Ostego County United Way in January of 2020. She would have never predicted how our world and community would change over the next few months. She is grateful to have been part of an organization that stepped up to help her. Megan moved to Gaylord from Washington, where she was studying photography with the Art Institute of Seattle. She opened Moments Photography and Photo Booth, which specializes in family photos, weddings, high school seniors, and photo booth rentals. Megan is also involved in Ostego County. She currently sits on the Gaylord Area Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors, the Board of Directors for Guardian Gals Incorporated, and the Board for Parker Defiance Campground. She chairs the Leadership Ostego County Program and is the Junior High Camp Director at Parker Defiance. In her free time, she enjoys traveling, camping, kayaking, hanging out in hammocks, and spending as much time outdoors with her daughter Lennon as possible. We're grateful that Megan was able to put this presentation together for us. Get it queued up here. Off to you. Hi, I'm Megan Hacker, owner of Moments Photography and Photo Booth. In my life, I actually tend to go by the name Many Hats Megan because I'm also the Assistant Executive Director for the Otsego County United Way. I'm an ordained priest with Community of Christ. I chair the Leadership Otsego County Program, and I'm a summer camp director there at Park of the Pines. I do the junior high camp, so 7th, 8th, and ninth graders. They're, believe it or not, my favorite age group. So I'm really sorry that I can't be there today to meet with you all. I am at a wedding expo at Sunshine Barn here in Gaylord, which is a great segue for our topic today, Courageously Choose Love. Moments actually started out as a photo booth rental business. Justin and I went to a wedding uh, that was my high school friend's wedding, and they had this sort of makeshift photo booth, and that was the first time I'd ever seen anything like that. And one of the gals that was sitting at our table said, yeah, our photographer told us that if we could figure out how to make a photo booth, she'd give us a discount on our, our wedding photos. And Justin and I sort of chatted about it later, and I thought, it can't be that hard, right? <laughs> well, we were living in Seattle at the time, and when we decided that we wanted to be closer to home and closer to our families, and we moved back to northern Michigan, um, we decided to look into photo booths. And when we got back to Gaylord, uh, we did some shopping around, and we ordered a photo booth from... Tennessee, I want to say, something like that. Uh, it was a lot of years ago in 2011. So we bought a photo booth that somebody was making. They shipped it to our home. It came in three giant boxes uh, and we started a photo booth business and we jumped right in and started doing weddings and high school graduations and senior open houses, all night parties, basically anything we could get into because we were having so much fun with it. Uh, that evolved into some of our friends asking if we would start photographing their weddings, which was terrifying. Uh, and so we jumped in and did a few of those. I went to school in Seattle to study photography, and Justin was always just sort of a natural with a camera. So we really enjoyed photographing weddings, but I really hated the back-end process of it with all of the editing and creating albums and galleries and delivering photos to clients and it was just taking so much time 
Justin and I were still both working full time. This was kind of a side gig for us. Uh, I was managing a bridal shop and he was working in the parts department at the Ford dealership in town. Um, so I, I tried to call it quits probably half a dozen times. And I would say, I just, I'm not having any fun and I don't like all this editing and I, you know, it stresses me out to be up all night because I was working during the day and then I'd be up all night editing because I wanted to deliver photos to clients because it was really important. Everybody wants to see their photos like the minute you're done taking them. Um, and I kept trying to call it quits and Justin said, let's give it another shot. And he was having a blast, which I, I credit that to the fact that he didn't have to do any of the editing work, but he was having such a good time and we had already agreed to do a handful more. So we kept at it. And after the first year, I loved it. I was so hooked on weddings because I loved watching people in love. It was just the coolest thing because not only do you see a couple that's so happily in love, but you see so much compromise and respect and creative ideas and just, just being surrounded by love every weekend was the best and I really enjoyed that and so we kept on so like I said our photography business started in 2011 we started shooting weddings in 2012 uh, Justin and I got engaged in 2013 so we uh, very much courageously chose love uh, when we moved home from Seattle uh, we lived in my mom's basement for a year while we saved up for a home we bought our first house, got engaged the very first night that we got to stay in the home. Um, and at that point, we were already running the business. So we had this plan that things were just going to work out, and we dove into it. And then in 2014, got married. And just after our wedding, I quit my full-time job. We opened a studio. And it was a really interesting transition because we went from having two incomes to essentially one. His income was covering our home and my income at the studio was covering all those studio bills, but we kept at it and we worked really hard and eventually one photo booth turned into two and then we got a third and then six weddings a year turned into, I think at the most we did, 22 in a in a summer basically you know from spring to fall because we're not shooting weddings in the winter there's not a whole lot of that happening up here in northern michigan in march of 2019 we had our daughter lennon so she just turned three and i am a workaholic and that's just sort of how i use my time and i had a really hard time transitioning from being in the studio full time to being home with a kiddo for a while i had decided i was going to take four weeks off and i changed my email and i changed my voicemail and i said you know we have this great thing that's happening and i'm going to be out of the studio for a while but leave a message and i'll call you back and i started sneaking into the studio and it was Maybe two weeks after Lennon was born, I was toting her to the office with me and Justin would swing by on lunch. What are you doing here? And I wasn't doing anything. I was just sitting in my office because that's where I was comfortable and that's where I wanted to be because I love my job. So we uh, had Lennon and she came to the office for quite a while and I worked um, when she was sleeping <laughs> and, and it worked out for quite a while. At the end of 2019, uh, Justin and I separated, which we thought might be temporary as we worked through some things. In January of 2020, I started as the Assistant Executive Director at the Adsego County United Way. And as you know, in March of 2020, the world stopped. Everything around us just came to a halt, which included all of the events and weddings and things that people had planned through the summer. We had a really full summer lined up and we were sort of at a loss of what to do. People um, in the beginning were, were kind of holding on to their dates and they were going to hold strong and they were going to have their event and they planned their wedding and they were going to fight to continue on and it was going to pass and you know we were going to do two weeks and it would blow over. And as you know, that didn't happen. 
And 2020 was such an interesting shift from this is what I'm supposed to do. This is the wedding I'm supposed to have, according to the movies and the books and the mother-in-laws. And, and it really shifted to if we're getting married this year, we're going to do it our way. And that was honestly my favorite year of photographing weddings because we had people at the full gamut of things. People postponed their weddings to 2021. We had people that said, you know what, we're just going to the courthouse with our parents and that's what we're doing and we don't need a photographer and it's just, it's gonna happen, we'll have a big party down the road. We had some really cool couples. One of them that sticks out in my mind was a couple in their early 20s that were scheduled to get married in a big Catholic church over in Petoskey. And then they were going to have their reception at a huge event hall. And it was just this massive, like, 300-person wedding. And it, it didn't feel like them at all. When I, I meet with our couples before they book us just to be sure that we're going to be a good fit, and when they were telling me just this giant Catholic wedding and this huge hall reception, and these are like down home country folks. He proposed to her. I'm not even kidding. He proposed to her with a cow. <laughs> they are dairy farmers. So he got her a cow and he tied a ring around that cow. And it was a gift and a proposal all in one. And when COVID hit, they decided they were going to shift from these two huge venues, which were closed, wasn't happening there. They cleaned out the barn and they did their wedding. Their ceremony was outside under this beautiful tree and in the field just across from the barn. And they did their reception in the cattle barn. That was the most genuine, sincere them wedding they could have ever planned. And it was beautiful because it was just so, it embodied who they were as people and what they cherished and what was important to them. And they didn't have to go by the rules. Uh, another one, we had a couple, again, it was scheduled to be a big wedding. They decided to downsize. They had 15 people. What they ended up doing is they rented an Airbnb and they were just gonna have their immediate friends and family uh, come and stay at the Airbnb. They were just gonna have a little shindig she actually called to cancel um, their photography because they were just going to do a tiny thing and she didn't feel like it was important. And I am such a, such a pusher for take the photos, you know, print them. Don't leave them on your computer because your computer is eventually going to die and then you're going to lose those photos. But take the photos and keep those memories, especially on that day that goes by so fast. So they downsized a whole bunch. They rented this Airbnb which amazingly enough had this beautiful antique barn and they did a, a great big uh, picnic table style dinner and it was so cool to be part of. Uh, a couple friends of ours, college friends of mine that had booked us for their wedding, they were architects in Detroit and when COVID happened, they were able to work from home for a while and then uh, they both got laid off. When they got laid off, they'd been saving for, once again, a great big huge wedding. And they decided they were gonna take some time and they took their honeymoon early and together they hiked the Appalachian Trail. If you can hike the Appalachian Trail with somebody that you're not even legally tied to, I think it's gonna work. So they took um, three and a half months and they hiked the whole trail. I can't even imagine how much they understand and trust each other now after that experience. So they did their ceremony at her parents' house in the backyard by the lake, and there were 12 people there. And then it was down in Kalamazoo, so I drove down for the ceremony. And then a couple months later, they had a reception where they invited more of their friends and family, but it was still at her folks' house under a tent in the yard. And Dan the groom, was so happy with how it worked out because he never once wanted to be the center of attention, but he was gonna do whatever she wanted to make the day special. So having the ability to scale it down and just be surrounded by their closest friends and the family that they love worked out really well for them. So we got through 2020 
and then 2021 was still pretty rocky. Um, it didn't pick up. We thought, okay, these are going to get moved to 2021. We're going to have a whole new crop of clients coming in because people are still getting engaged and they're still together and that didn't stop and love didn't stop. Uh, but 2021 was still, people were skeptical about trying to put together events and not knowing if it was going to happen or not. So when the world shut down, it really forced people to think creatively. And I think it really gave people a solid understanding of what's important to them. Um, being surrounded by friends and family that you don't really know and aren't really close to, and it's somebody that you have to invite because your mom says you have to. and uh, watching these couples have the opportunity to do it exactly how they want to do it, for the most part. I mean, some people had to cancel great big huge weddings and that's exactly what they wanted. But for the most part, every wedding that we photographed in the last two years, people have expressed how grateful they were to have the opportunity to not be restricted by all of the rules. Justin and I got divorced in 2021. And you may be wondering, as the story went, when we separated in 2019, how we were still shooting weddings together. Well, Justin and I were friends for several years before we got engaged. And he was my best friend through our whole marriage. And he's still one of my best friends. And we co-parent really, really well together. And that was one of those things that was really important to us was not only keeping our relationship strong uh, so that we could be a solid unit for our daughter, but also keeping our families cohesive. Because some of you, if you've been through a divorce, know how difficult it can be to deal with your in-laws. And I, I'm lucky, I have really great ex-in-laws. Um, but you know how hard it can be to keep the peace because people are hurt and people are sad by these changes. And we have worked really hard actually some people this if you know us this might actually be news to you because there are people that still don't know that we're divorced because we do a lot together we took her to disney on ice a couple weekends ago down in grand rapids and we got an airbnb and i'm leaking a little bit because my family's so important to me but we got an airbnb we stayed the weekend we took her to disney on ice she was awful <laughs> but i had my my teammate my partner there with me um and Justin has, has continued to prove that he is on my side and we are on the same team all the time. So we're continuing to work together. We will continue to shoot weddings together and uh, we're gonna forever be rooting each other on and cheering the other person on because we both uh, care so deeply about each other. It just didn't work out for us to be married. So moments will continue on. Uh, I'll have to change our business cards because they're kind of cheesy and they've always said husband and wife photographers best friends <laughs> so we'll tweak it a little bit as we progress forward but we're going to continue on with courage and with compassion and with all of those uh things that are so important for us to portray to our daughter because she's the next round of courageous leaders that we're we're bringing up into the world. And if you've met her, you know she's very strong-willed and she is very independent and she's very bossy. <laughs> and I don't have any idea who she gets that from, but uh, anytime I say that she's stubborn, people look at me like, and I'm starting to understand. <laughs> so I, I'm so grateful that you guys let me share a little bit about my story and my business today. And I hope you're getting so much out of this seminar and this event that you're, you're attending. I'm sorry I can't be there. I'm hoping to maybe swing by for pizza later. I hope you're having a great day. Um, let's continue to to just embrace this life and, and this world and all of the people that we encounter uh, with grace and compassion and understanding. And you never know, you know, what somebody's story is or what they've been through. And I think every day we courageously choose to love each other. So have a great day. <laughs>
All right, thank you, Megan, for that beautiful message. And uh, I'm excited to introduce our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is also a pre-recorded session and it's by Dylan Weaver. Dylan is a 25-year-old transgender male from Portland, Oregon. Dylan has a passion for people and the way we communicate with one another. This passion is lived out and evident in Dylan's work on the Board of Directors of Harmony, who served together there. And most days you can find Dylan with loved ones, either playing games, eating, or both. And I can certainly understand that. <laughs> so give us just a moment to get Dylan's uh, video together here. Hello. For those who don't know me, which would be most of you, my name is Dylan Weaver. I am a trans male who lives in Portland, Oregon, born and raised here, lived here for the last 25 years. Um, and as far as courageously choose love goes, um, I have a couple of stories. Um, the first one is from when I was little. I have always been uh, authentically myself, meaning that I, I decided to play with my, uh, <laughs> my, uh, Star Wars action figures in my Barbie dream house, or, um, was always in whatever I wanted to wear. So whether it was multiple blues, it really didn't go together. If it was a flowered skirt or, um, pretty much I, I lived my life, um, as, as authentically as I could from an early age. And, I, and I'm very blessed to have, um, that support system. But uh, the first time that I courageously chose love was probably when I was about four. And my grandparents live um, over the mountain. So there's, you gotta go through all the trees and there's snow. And I, I was a very thoughtful child. And uh, at this at this point in my life, we, we weren't going to church. My father had stepped away when he was an older teenager and, and decided that, you know, the church life wasn't for him. He didn't want to sit in the the two hours, or sorry, the, the long services. It was a two hour drive to get to church. Um, he got car sick every time. So he just, he had just stopped going. So when I was little, we, we weren't a church going family. However, when we went to visit my grandparents, we always went to church. And as a four year old, I had a lot of questions and the biggest question I had was, what happened to Jesus? You know, this was Easter time. Um, we just talked about Jesus dying and um, all these things. And I asked my dad, well, what happened to Jesus? And not wanting to scare me, he told me that some bad men ran Jesus up a tree and that he was in every every tree. So uh, on the way back from, from my grandparents' house, I was very quiet, which was very unusual for me. And my dad asked what was happening, and um, I told him that I was looking in every every tree, and I just couldn't find Jesus. And and I understand why he didn't want to scare me, right? But um, but I got to church because my dad told me that Jesus was still alive, and he was in all the trees, and I couldn't find him. So he decided that we needed to go back to church, and um, there I found the the love and support of of a great community, and that love and support has followed me through my entire life. Um, I was never a very feminine female. I, uh, I didn't like skirts. I didn't like dresses. I would rather roll in the mud and, uh, ride my bike and, and, uh, play with my action figures than I would have tea parties or anything like that. Um, and this church family always loved and supported me no matter what. Um, when I was 15, I came out as gay, which, um, really wasn't a, a surprise I but I never found any backlash not from um not from my parents not from my family um, I was just always loved with open arms people um, I would bring partners home and um, it was it was just as if I had brought a boyfriend home um, my my parents loved them my church family loved them and I, I never really felt different I 
Um, and I w I'm very glad to have, have that support in that community. I came out at 15 and then, uh, when I was over those like 10 years, I did some, some soul searching and, and, you know, the lesbian title never really fit. I never really felt comfortable in my skin. I hated, I hated my body and, uh, it took a while, but I figured out what trans was and I figured out that that's what I was. So, uh, fast forward to when I was 23, I had graduated college a year before, but I was going back for, for some more education. And then I texted my parents one day that, that I was trans and that I was going to change my name. Um, at one point in my life, my mother had told me that I was born in, in, in the correct body and that God loved me no matter what. And I know what she meant by that, but it was still kind of terrifying to tell her, hey, no, like God made me who I am, but I was not born in the correct body. I, uh, I struggle with, with who I am in this form and, I, and I'd like to to live more authentically. Um, and so, so I texted them and it, it was well received. It was like, oh, okay, we still love you. Come home for dinner, whatever. Um, but that, um, <clears throat> that night, my mother actually threw me a surprise party. and invited all of my friends and family and they came and they truly loved me for who I was. <laughs> and I never felt more loved than I did in that moment. <laughs> and there was my, my friend from school friends I've been friends with for 10, 10 years, um, and, and my church family was there too. And I never, I never doubted that they loved me or they accepted me. And I'm, I was courageously being myself and I was so vulnerable. <laughs> they were there and they and they loved me. Um I've been out for three years and before COVID I I did summer camps and I again was met with with open arms and sorry. Um <clears throat> and uh I was able to to go to camp as as myself. I um I was able to be authentically myself and and uh show up as who I am and not have to hide or worry. Um and and I feel like my story shows um Sorry. <clears throat> Shows authentic love on, on both sides. Uh, courageous love. Because it, it can be scary to, to, to come out and to, to... To show your true colors. To show um, all of you. And I, I am so blessed and thankful to... <clears throat> To have a community that supports me, and and I'm so thankful that I found it in a church setting when so many people um have been so hurt by <clears throat> by the notion of church. Um, some of my 
<clears throat> some of my best memories and my, my closest friends come from church. Um, and I'm, I'm so thankful to have that. Um, you know, love doesn't have to be this big dramatic act. Um, for me, it's those small connections. It's, you know, someone calling me by my name. Um, that's, that's all I really wanted. And to have such abundant and overpowering love has, has made the world of difference in my life and those around me. Um, these past three years have been the happiest times in my life. Um, the most challenging But I wouldn't trade it for anything. <laughs> um. <clears throat> it's it's led me to great opportunities as far as, you know, going to church and going to, to camps and myself and showing other kids that they can be whoever they want to be. And they can they can be courageous and, and they can they can find strength in those around them. Um It's also led me to, to Harmony, where, where I'm currently the secretary and I'm able to provide ministry um, in, in ways that, that I didn't even know possible. You know, I, through Harmony, I have a, a group and a community of people who, who have lived similar struggles that I have um, and some have lived other struggles that, I've, that I haven't, that I, um, but I'm so thankful that we're all um, able to to join together and to to show that you know the love of God isn't isn't just for for one type of people. Um, so, you know, courageously choose love is. It's easy to think about, um, but to, to actually courageously choose love and to, to be authentically yourself every day is, is so powerful. And, you know, I'm so appreciative of all of those in my life. I'm so appreciative of being able to, to just live and be who I truly am. So, sometimes courageously choosing love is just choosing to be who, you're, who you are. It's choosing to love fearlessly and endlessly without exceptions, without expectations. Courageously choosing love is opening a space for all people, no matter their lived experiences, no matter what, um, what they've gone through in their lives. Courageously choosing love is to, to fling the church, church doors open wide, to to letting, um, letting all those around you know that, that they are perfect and, and loved just as they are. Courageously choosing love can be terrifying. It, it's hard. It's, it's something that you have to actively do to put work into. Um, it's not something that comes easy to a lot of people. We have judgments. We have, uh, preperceptions of what we think people's life should be. But courageously choosing love means to to love with without without judging someone, without having them fit that perfect bubble of of what what you think they should be. Courageously choosing love is to live fearlessly and 
with with everything that you have no matter what and i'm so thankful for for all the people in my life um and and for you to listen to this to even though i'm a crying blubbery mess i mean i i can't be more authentically myself than than i am right now i i i wear i i one thing that i've learned about being trans is like i can't go anywhere and not come out to people um, and so to be able to have that community is is so so powerful and and i thank you for watching and listening and and i hope that you know you go out there and you choose to courageously love all those around you every day without a second thought thank you Thank you, I want to thank uh, Dylan for his vulnerability and willingness to, to share that with us. When he sent me the video, he said, I didn't know I was going to ugly cry in the middle of it. So I watched it ahead of time so that I wouldn't ugly cry in front of all of you today. Um, but I'm excited to introduce our next speaker. Um, he submitted a really humble biography. Uh, that I'll read to you, but I'll also add the uh, personal note that uh, Dr. Gravius is one of my professors uh, at ETS, and he's an Old Testament scholar and a, a fantastic teacher. He's an associate professor of biblical studies at Ecumenical Theological Seminary in Detroit. Uh, he's a noted speaker and author, and he has published widely in both academic journals and popular magazines like Sojourners. He has a new book coming out, and I did share the link in our event group. Remember, he didn't ask me to plug this, but I'm going to plug it because I read the description and it sounds really cool. So remember that pre-orders are really important for authors. And his newest book is called Lurking Under the Surface, Horror, Religion, and the Questions That Haunt Us. And that will be available from Broad Youth Books in October. He has a very um, interesting set of interests, so I know he's going to have a great message for us. He's also a musician. So. Uh, welcome, Dr. Grapius, and thanks for being here with us live today. Oh, thank you so much for the, the kind words, Reverend Stanbridge. Grace and peace to all of you this afternoon. I am deeply grateful for the invitation to speak at this conference and for the time you've given to listen to some of my reflections on this conference's fascinating theme. A special thanks again to Reverend Stanbridge for both the invitation and the kind introduction. And for all the work that she and the other organizers have done to make this happen. I've been on the, the edges of coordinating some conferences and know how challenging that is. Well, my, my um, reflections today are gonna be a little bit different from the, the previous ones we've, we've heard. Um, I certainly am in my professorial mode here, but hopefully it will still be, be engaging, even if I'm not as, as deeply personal, and there will probably be no wonderful, ugly crying in the middle of it. Those were two really moving presentations. I love those. Hope you enjoyed those too. So for the, the theme of this, this conference, um, it's amazing to me how much can be packed into three words, particularly when you, you take those three words and juxtapose them together so that we're forced to kind of think through the relationship between those three words. Courageously choose love sounds like a simple commandment, though I'm sure the process of discerning those three words as a conference theme was anything but simple. Um, I can only imagine how many drafts happened to get to courageously choose love. Of course, there is so much in the depths of how these three words connect with each other or perhaps even crash into each other. Courageously, obviously, stands out as an important concept. We've seen a lot of courage so far this morning and this afternoon. It's a way to highlight the dangerous world we find ourselves in and how love can frequently be construed as a countercultural choice. One that puts the person who decides to love in the position of standing against major currents that run through our world. But the word that jumped out to me for my reflection today is actually choose. And I think this word is important. Because often what we run into in the world is an individual or a group or a church who thinks that their faith and the particular expressions of it 
are just straightforward truth claims and they're not responsible for any of the outcomes. We might at various points in our life feel that way ourselves. You feel that these are truth claims and then because they're just following what the Bible or their denomination or their pastor says about it, they're not really responsible. When we remove the element of choice from our religion, we're suddenly absolved of any responsibility. We get to wash our hands and go on with the business of supporting a budget that doesn't provide adequate resources for those who have been victimized by our economic system or making laws that target LGBTQ Q youth for harassment or any other number of outcomes that have real tangible effects on individuals. These outcomes might make us sad, but we're powerless against them. After all, faith tells us that this is the only choice we have, right? So it's not our fault that we can't bake a cake for someone or that we have to throw books out of a classroom or we can't affirm the gender identity of a teenager. We wish we could be welcoming, but that's not what the Bible says. Of course, I'm going to spend the next few minutes pushing back on that idea and urging us all to hold ourselves accountable for our beliefs. I do believe our faith is a faith rooted in love, in welcome, in acceptance, and that everything we believe is a choice in one way or another. I'm a biblical scholar by trade. One of the cor courses I teach at Ecumenical Theological Seminary is biblical hermeneutics. That's a, a $2 word that just means theories of interpretation. At its essence, this course is about how to read the Bible. In Introduction to the Hebrew Bible or Introduction to the New Testament, we learn what's in these books. But in biblical hermeneutics, we think through what our strategies are for reading them, what it means to engage deeply, faithfully, and honestly with the Bible. I mention this because I, I think these reflections that I'm offering today are largely hermeneutical in nature. They're about how we relate to the Bible, how we choose to read it, and as a result, how we relate to our faith. This idea of how we read the Bible as being a choice is one that students sometimes have a hard time getting their minds around. I mean, the Bible says things, and the choice we have is whether to believe them or not, right? No. If it were that simple, my job as a professor of Bible would be much easier. When we confront a particular passage of the Bible, the first choice we're faced with is how we understand it. Reading is always interpretation. Passages don't interpret themselves any more than any other text does, just because we're able to read the translated words that the passage is comprised of. Some passages might be more or less easy to understand than others, but you still have to interpret. That can mean looking at the passage in its literary context to understand it more deeply, diving deep into the vocabulary to make sure it says what our initial impression tells us it might mean, possibly learning about the historical context of the passage to figure out how it can fit into the Bible as a whole. Every, every one of these steps is fraught with a series of choices. At each point, we could decide to turn in another direction, and now all of a sudden we're reading the passage differently. And then, then there's the layer of choice that occurs when you bring the canon into conversation with itself. The Bible clearly contains a mess of contradictions, and I believe that's because the authors and compilers understood how complicated our world is. So as just one example, the Ten Commandments say thou shalt not kill, but then we see all kinds of killing happening in the Bible. And yes, we can talk about whether the Hebrew is closer to kill or murder, but then we're engaged in the work of interpretation. We're making choices. So while the Bible might say thou shalt not kill on one hand, it's also aware of the geopolitical realities of trying to run a developing nation state in the ancient Near East. Scripture expects us to work through these contradictions on our own with the help of our faith, our traditions, the Holy Spirit, and each other. The idea of choice itself is key in the Bible, most famously perhaps in Deuteronomy 30 when Moses is near the end of his farewell speech. Moses has spent most of the book exhorting the people to follow the commandments of God. The book is really the closest thing to an extended sermon we find in the Bible. And Moses wraps the book up with some well-known words. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. 
Of course, that phrase, choose life, has wormed its way into our political discourse. And it's a great example of what I mean when I suggest that reading is interpretation. Choose life in its original context refers to the whole nexus of decisions we make about our relationships to God and to each other, about how we treat one another. Moses is referring to a bunch of things all at once. Moses certainly didn't have the abortion debate in mind when he uttered these words. To get there, you have to make some interpretive leaps and make decisions regarding what you think it means to choose life and how you understand the ways in which God is calling you to do this. It's not a simple, straightforward directive. So when we read the Bible, we're making choices about how to interpret it all the time. And then we take what we've read and use it to inform and deepen our faith. Then we're making another set of choices. At every step of the way, we're faced with the choice of whether we're going to read the Bible and practice our faith through a lens of exclusion, through a lens of scarcity, through a lens of fear. Or if we want to make different choices and use a hermeneutics of inclusion, a hermeneutics of grace, a hermeneutics of love. Our first speaker this morning, Aida, talked about an ethics of love being a way to live in the world. And I'm I think I'm advocating for a similar form of reading the Bible, reading through a lens of love. Our Bible has passages like Deuteronomy 23.3, where Yahweh tells the people through Moses, no Ammonite or Moabite shall be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. Even to the 10th generation, none of their descendants shall be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. It's a text of exclusion. Since the Israelites have been historical enemies of the Ammonites and Moabites, the text tells us that this group of people will never be admitted into the presence of God, will never be at peace with Israel. Interestingly, the ancient rabbis who wrote numerous volumes of interpretation on all of these texts figured out how to take this commandment literally, but still hold on to a hermeneutics of inclusion. Since the Ammonites and the Moabites are no longer existing people, have been, been wiped out, um, there's nothing to worry about. We don't have to bother excluding any actually existing people from the assembly of the Lord. It's quite a clever way to get around that. But our Bible also has passages like Isaiah 56, where God announces, do not let the foreigner join to the Lord, say the Lord will surely separate me from his people. And then a few verses down, for my house shall be a house of prayer for all people. In this passage, our faith is described as one of welcome, one of inclusion, one of love. And we might also think of the book of Ruth where rather than excluding Moabites, Ruth the Moabite is revealed to be the ancestor of King David. That's kind of the punchline at the end of that book. Along with choosing how we read passages, we can choose which ones become more central to our identity. Those that keep people out or those that welcome people in. Living out our faith isn't an easy thing. I've been talking all about the choices we make, but we also know that in making these choices, we try as hard as we can to listen to where God's leading us. So I don't want to give the impression that I'm presenting a vision of faith that's completely individualistic, one where we just get to walk through the buffet line and pick whatever we want. It's not that kind of a choice. Instead, faith is a series of choices we make in deep consultation with the Holy Spirit with our tradition, with our conscience, with everything that goes into our life of faith. But we still make choices, even if they're guided ones. And we're still accountable for those choices we make. When Jesus was asked by one of the tricky lawyers who always seem to pop up in the, the New Testament, asked about what laws he thought were the most important, Jesus summarized all of the laws into two, which he also said were really just one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Both of those come from the Hebrew Bible. The first from Deuteronomy, the second from Leviticus. Um, raise your hand if you knew there was uh, anything that good in the book of Leviticus. What Jesus is doing here is practicing the principle that is sometimes called the hermeneutical key. It's the idea that when we read the Bible or really approach our faith at all, we take one main concept 
one overarching principle and apply everything through that lens. For Jesus, love of God and love of neighbor is the key that unlocks everything. Augustine referred to this as the love principle. If you're reading scripture and your understanding doesn't lead you to love, you haven't understood the passage right. I wouldn't go that far. For me, there are passages that don't do a great job of living up to that principle. I think it's an important part of the work of faith to name that and be honest about the places where our scripture and our tradition as a whole doesn't live up to its best ideals. But for me, it's also important that this overarching ideal doesn't just come from what Dr. Grafius thinks is the right way to live and to relate to each other in the divine. It comes from our tradition itself. Jesus told us plain as day that this is how we should read the Bible. And I would say as an extension, how we should practice our faith. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. That sure sounds like choosing love courageously to me. Faith is always a question of choice. The choices we make as we try to live out our faith say so much about how we understand God, how we see the world, and how we understand ourselves. For me, one of the most important parts of living an honest life of faith is to recognize that we are making choices. Choices in how we read, choices in how we worship, and choices in who we exclude and who we embrace. We need to acknowledge those choices, own them courageously. Thank you so much. In the name of Jesus Christ, welcome to this moment in history where God is calling for prophetic community to emerge, drawn from the nations of the world that is characterized by uncommon devotion, the compassion, and peace of God revealed in Jesus Christ. Today, in our prayers, we remember the people of Slovenia, located in the southern central Europe, bordered by Italy, Austria, Hungary, Croatia, and Egypt. I read from scripture today in 1 John chapter 3, verses 14, 16, and 17. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love one another. Whoever does not love abides in death. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in one who has the world's good and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? Our prayer for peace today is by the Lord. Let's pray. Dear God, in the name of the Prince of Peace, we pray. Wanting to express our deep gratitude for your abiding love and grace. We pray for persons experiencing the turmoil of brokenness that separates them from others and from tempting the children. May your peace bring fullness where there is brokenness. We pray for persons who are experiencing the agony of physical pain, which presents the expression of joyful living. May your peace bring comfort amid such pain. We pray for your creation of plant and animal, and humankind who lies in the stewardship of your generous handiwork. May all persons strive for peaceful living with all of creation. We pray for the earth's children. May the youth experience the peace that passes all understanding. 
May the adult children and child leave a legacy of true shalom for future generations. May the peace of God dwell in our hearts, in our words, and in our actions as we agree with each other throughout the days. Amen. <coughs> The reading for you is a hand blessed to the tie that binds. It's printed in the community of Christ Sings, as many as three from the Son, and the word from John Paul. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love, the fellowship of kindred minds is like that to that above. Before our God we come, before our ardent prayers, our fears, our hopes, our aims are one our comforts and our cares. We share our mutual woes, our mutual burdens bear, and often for each other flows the sympathizing tears. When here our pathways part, we suffer mutual pain, <coughs> and Christ in one in heart, we hope to meet again. As we enter a time of guided prayer, meditation, reflection, you are invited to offer tiny prayers or meditate during the moments of time. The prayers of the people begin with individual Jesus and then move out to include the human community. Allow yourself to come reverently and be present for the time as we join us in the Transformative encounters will be needed here with the eternal creator and reconciler. Creator God, cleanse our hearts. Accept the confession of our flaws and failure and make us whole. Transform us, O God, into the persons of grace and grant and grace you created us to be. Redeeming God, bring to our awareness those persons and relationships that are broken, and make us conscious of the need for reconciliation and return. Transform us to a relationship of wholeness and strength. Redeeming <coughs> God. Allow us to feel your love and concern for your children and communities around the world, far and near. We remember all nations, including Slovenia, the country we pray for today. May we weep with your tears and act with compassion to say hello to the protesting. God of all creation, stir within us a deep connection with everything you have created. Make us aware of the sacred nature of all that surrounds us and use us as a deep reverence that cultivates nurturing and compassion. May these prayers of concern, compassion, and transformation for ourselves, others, all people, and the earth, we have into a world shaped by your unconditional love and love. Amen. <coughs> well, thank you for joining us in the second session of our conference today. We will continue with the third session starting at four o'clock. So invite you back in two hours if you're using the same Zoom link if you're online. As we close this session, we leave you with the thoughts to cherish inner peace, honor relationships, become communities of love, joy, hope, and peace. Go in peace. Yeah.